welcome everyone and thank you all for being here. Quite cramped, quite hot, I'm very sorry about this matter. Um, so, very excited about having you all this evening um, for many reasons. One, I think, is because you know, we're very interested about how we think about art and the narrative being our art itself, but also um, how we make art and the technical input um, behind art itself. Um, and I think there's no perfect match than philosophy and art for that to actually bring up that conversation this evening. And, and even more excitingly, I think actually the Nyalpo speakers is likely to bring up a really good conversation. Um, so I'm going to start the introduction. I've got here Gretchen Andrew, who's shown through um, digital and online digital platform a new way to actually develop an artistic practice and learn and develop her own artistic voice as well. Then next to her, I've got um, Sasha Golom, who is director and the head of the Centre of Visual and Philosophy here at King's College London. Next to him, I have Vanessa Brassi, who is currently writing a PhD here in philosophy at King's College London, but also has an extensive understanding and experience in the creative industry. And then finally, but nonetheless, I have Lina Victor, who is an artist as well and defines herself very interesting, uh, very, in an interesting matter about conceptual art. I'm sorry, I completely ruined your introduction. <laughs> she, she, Lina defines herself as a conceptual artist, which I think is very interesting, which is also actually the point I'm going to jump on for my first question. So I feel that in terms of the space of creativity, um, there's always that battle about whether um, process or whether concept matter most and almost what can first and what, what develops the artistic practice, the most important matter. So I feel that, Lina, you take a stage by saying that you define yourself as a conceptual artist. Mm -hmm. So therefore, does that mean you put concept first or what's your vision with regards to concept versus process in creativity? Um, when it comes to the work I do, my, the concept is what leads, basically. Um, all the work I, I do has a very clear um, philosophy, whether it is actually understood on from the viewer's standpoint, um, in the, initially when you see the work, there is a very clear thought process and kind of um, ideology that goes into the work that I do and the reason I use the materials I use and kind of um, I'm, I'm very inspired by mathematic and scientific principles that are kind of imbued within the work and all of these things I think are what make my work very concept driven. However, that does not mean that you cannot appreciate it from an aesthetic standpoint uh, without having with that backstory, that narrative behind it. Can we see, because um, obviously that's the studio of Lina, so obviously you can't see your own images, but I can translate it, <laughs> what's um. happening on that side. But, um, and that's a few works of Lina as well, so I'm showing actually the image in your studio where you have all those big paintings with you in, um, in um. them, so the latest body of work. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so basically the concept for me is what leads in the process. You know, I, I wouldn't say my work is process driven. My work is very calculated. It's very, um, you know, controlled. And so the process is a means for me to convey the concept. I think the concept is what's really important to me. However, the finished product, I do want it to have aesthetic value and to be something that can be, uh, um, that has a message that is driven by a visual narrative. Um, but, but yeah, okay. that's the new body of work there. Well, moving on to this young lady, um, so the second artist of this evening. So, obviously, that's, that's some more, I mean, I, I think we highlighted this, but some more conceptual vision from Lina's hand. Um, you've, you've gone on YouTube and Google how to paint and learn to paint, yet what you were following on YouTube, and always said, you know, you, you wanted to develop your practice, and the practice seemed the core of your art. So do you... How do you feel when you hear that from Lina? What's your standpoint on it? Yeah, and um, of course what I'm sharing is just my own interest and value in the way that I want to make, um, which is um, sort of the flip side of that approach, which is to say there might be a philosophy or an idea that you can pull out afterwards, but um, the aesthetic is what drives it. And for me, that's primarily because my relationship to ideas is very based in language. And language to me is a very specific and somewhat limiting thing. If I can tell you what I want to convey, then I want to tell you, I want to be a writer, I want to be a musician. To me, an artist, a painter, is best serving their craft by making something that can be done only through the medium. 
and um, to me, that's, that's my favorite art. That's what got me into it. Um, can we see actually an example of um, Gretchen's work? So you've got almost two practices, right? So you've got the gift making, which is your latest residency on digital art base, and then your paintings. Do you want... Because yeah, I'm so that's, that is a bit confusing. And um, what you're seeing up there is um, part of my gift project that I can talk about extensively, but right now I'll just talk about it in relationship to my painting practice. Um, I see my digital practice very much as a practice, as practice-based research, as something that is more conceptually driven and exists in the realm of ideas. I write a lot for that practice. Um, but then it relates to my painting practice in that, as Maureen was saying, when I learned to paint, I did it um, primarily on YouTube at the beginning. I searched, how do I stretch a canvas? How do I paint clouds? How do I be an artist? And that's still what I'm doing. That's still this um, thing that is part of me that underlines my painting practice. So the gift practice, the digital practice, is abstracting that away from painting and looking at how do you become something? Can you learn different skills and become something different? Can you fake it till you make it? So my painting practice is almost a subset of this question of how do you become something, um, but this evening mostly I'll be speaking about my view of what I think great art is, not what, how, not interesting ways to convey ideas, which is more what my gift practice is doing. So, um, so I think that, that was a great way to start with like the two artistic visions, but obviously from a philosophical standpoint, I'm sure the field has, pl has plenty to say on those two matters. So whoever wants to come first and put forward the, what do you think process versus concept in the creativity space? Well, I, th I think what was did you want to yeah, I think what was quite interesting for me when when we kind of initially talked about having this kind of panel was, does the philosopher really have anything of interest to say to the artist? Because when you study philosophy of art, and I don't know if anyone in the room has or is you know is knowledgeable about art, one of the disappointments I think for many of us is that the artist somehow just gets left out of the picture, mm -hmm. and you end up discussing very abstract ideas. What's the experience? Um, what's, the, what's the product, which bit's the art, is it in the audience's mind, and everyone's very busy discussing everything except what is the artist doing, and how amazing, and how is it unique, and how does it differ from the mathematician or the scientist. Um, and those, that's one of the things that I was really interested to come along today and really get the discussion going was, are some of the things that we think about in philosophy relevant to the artist at all? I mean, certainly the things the artist is saying here are very relevant to the philosopher, um, and they're interesting for us to think about, but I think it would be good to see some of that going back the other way. Um, well, that's something we can explore. I'm yeah. very interested in what we're going to for Sasha. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that was, that was fascinating. I mean, this issue of concept and process, I think, has been a dangerous one philosophically, because philosophy is often very imperialistic. So you've had lots and lots of philosophical projects that try and say things like, well, if you're really talking about concepts, then wouldn't it be better to talk about concepts and, for example, to write a little philosophical book about concepts, and before you know it, you have this kind of uh, colonization of the artistic space by, by the philosophical project. I'm thinking here Academics particularly... in general. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm thinking here particularly of people, people like Hegel, but I, mean, I think it's, it's a kind of wider sickness. Paul um, Sasha, you sat next to someone that like, has a stronger view about yeah, academia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, and, and, and that'll be interesting. We'll have to talk about that. I mean, I think, I think the other thing that came out where I completely agree with you is... is this interbalance of concept and process, and what seems to me really interesting, and what I'm particularly interested in, is how um, the two kind of mingle. So it's not which comes first, but it's how they bleed together. You know, mm -hmm. so if I suppose I, I write a, a sociological study of obsession, you know, obsession in different cultures. I write a novel about obsession. I do a painting about obsession. I write a poem about obsession. I have a philosophy of obsession. Mm -hmm. Now, in some sense, those are all about the same thing, right? They're all about obsession. But in another sense, of course, the kind of dynamic of the material, the, you know, the, the texture of what you're working with, be it concepts or words or the rhythm of the poem or the paint on the canvas is radically, radically different. And so, you know, I think this concept process issue, what's so interesting there is how the two mingle, mingle in such a way that the distinction can't even be made anymore, that, the, you know, 
clearly we can see some sense in which my painting, my poem, my novel, my philosophical theory, my sociological project are all about the same topic. But in another sense, the texture of the material has radically transformed that topic. And it's that kind of balance that I think is particularly interesting in, in relation to this issue. Well, I think, so there's one thing that, for, that philosophy is still very, very useful is when it comes to creating artistic movements, because you have that perspective into, you know, how people analyze artists, why they will reflect on certain time and space, but also the meanings that they, they bring in within their artworks. Um, so actually, I think that might be the time to bring formationism, mm. uh, which is a new artistic movement just having as much input into philosophy than it has into process art itself. So I'm leaving over to Yuli now on that. Yeah, so formationism is this uh, movement that a few artists that Maureen and I are um, involved with, we kind of are championing this idea that, you know, we've kind of had this uh, period in time where process-driven art was, was the most... Um, you know, was, was discussed as the process being the main and the most important aspect of the creation of a work. And then there's a side of it which says concept is actually more important, conceptual artists that kind of put concept above the process and it comes to, so the aesthetic value at the end of the day doesn't really necessarily have to matter. Formationism is marrying the two things together. So basically saying that, yes, the work is very concept driven, it's very conceptual, there's a lot of philosophical kind of um, vantage points and ideologies behind the creation of that work that drives the, um, the motivation of the work. However, at the end of the day, like I said earlier, the aesthetic value, the finished product, has an, it, it, just as much significance as that process. So it's basically marrying the two. And um, I do definitely feel that the work I do is very much in that kind of vein, even though I do call myself a conceptual artist, because the reason I say I'm conceptual is because the ideas that I have have to transcend my medium. Right. So I want it to be able to funnel into the film world. I want people to funnel into the pa into paintings, into sculptures, into performance. The idea is king to me, and then the medium and how it needs to be transferred is ser seriously just how it needs, how I feel it, it would best suit the narrative and the story. So uh, on that, Sasha, um, I have a question actually. Um, it's obviously we feel that the philosophy of a work is almost as narrative in our field. Would you put a difference on the philosophical standpoint? Is that, is that something you would defer? Or? As opposed to not, so you mean not thinking about it as a narrative? Is there a difference between philosophy of arts and yeah. then the narrative in the way we build them? We still will call them philosophies of work. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think, you know, there's, so I think one thing that's really, really important is that people don't try and police the word philosophy. I mean, I don't think that's ever going to get anywhere. I think um, there's going to be a spectrum in which artists have a range of kind of conceptual commitments and they're more or less important for individual artists. I think something that is interesting that kind of philosophy as a subject can offer some insight on is, is when people position their work in terms of a philosophy with a capital P. Right. So, I mean, for example, the whole process of forming artistic movements, yeah. okay? And the process, you know, you go back even just in the 20th century, you look at the obvious cases, look at the, you know, the various surrealist manifestos, and something. this process of creating an artistic movement, of creating a set of commitments for that, what's the kind of sociology of the process? How do you, how might philosophers understand that act, the act of coming to have a philosophy, the act of presenting yourself as a group with a philosophy. Um, so that seems to me, that kind of meta level of reflection, I think, is something that, in a way, it's easier for someone outside the art world to do, um, partly because we're not tied in the same way to the whims and functions of the art market, and so it's, it's more easy to take a critical perspective so on that. Are there movements aligned with philosophies at a certain point in time that you could present as examples that we could relate to? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there are lots and lots of cases where you've had artistic, you know, what are clearly artistic movements that have had been subject to radical philosophical intervention. So if you take the same example I used a minute ago, surrealism. Mm -hmm. You know, surrealism is kind of toddling along in a sort of, um, I think, you know, in some ways producing very good work, in other ways producing very twee work, and you get this sort of shattering intervention from Bataille, and then the Bataille Breton debacle, and Bataille's challenging this philosophically, saying, you know, you claim in some sense to be outside reason, but actually your notion of what's unreasonable is very contained, it's very sentimental. Mm. And that seems to be a profound philosophical challenge to that artistic project, and one that forces them to do better work afterwards. That's right. Okay. And I'd, I'd like to just comment on this idea of the oh, artistic I'm so sorry. movement. Sorry. <laughs> the artistic movement in general is something, um, as Shas was saying, is that it very much takes place in time and space. Um, it's relevant to what's going on in the world, in um, in, in even just saying that you and I are both alive at the same time. 
I would like to think if Edvard Munch or Van Gogh were alive today, like I'd be part of their artistic movement, um, but they're not, and we don't hang out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> however, that's, those are the people that I spend my time with. Those are the people whose ideas I live in, and I very much am against this idea of progress in art. Uh, my mentor, a great UK painter named Billy Childish, he has this belief that if Martians came to Earth and they had to arrange all the artwork in the order in which they thought it had been made, the stuff that you see at most contemporary galleries now would be considered very primitive, very early and like shit. <laughs> but Van Gogh would be up there at the end, like this is definitely the pinnacle. Like, you know, it's, it's a way of looking at this notion of progress in art. Um, but I think that also touches on this idea of context Artistic movements very much are responding to whether it's political context, national context, um, whereas an art that is more aesthetic than conceptual, you can take out of context. You can put it on a coffee mug, you can put it on a wall of a cave, you can um, have it mediated through an electronic device. Most of the art that's existing today, like people were not imagining us sitting on iPads flipping through it. They were imagining us having an aesthetic, embodied relationship to its size and structure and mass. Um, but especially as we see digital and the internet completely change and bastardize the majority of art that's ever been made, as an artist today, I'm very aware that I have no idea how my art is going to be viewed and experienced. What those people know, what language they speak, what their context is. and. To me, again, that's one of these sort of pushes for the aesthetic um, because it's embodied and it, it doesn't need information. So I think to that, um, so obviously we've attempted to define creativity here, but um, you're talking about what will be relevant later. And I feel that the way I, at least I would view philosophy is what will add distance and what uh, gives you perspective and reflection so you can reflect on things better. So what, when it comes to the notion of judgment into art, um, what is the field feeling about this matter? Like the idea of judgment of aesthetics. Because you said, of course, I'm sure you can judge something when it matters to the context, but also aesthetically or... How do you? How yeah, would you? I think, I think it depends. There's no like one answer to how the field judges it because the one thing about philosophy is you can be sure that if there's two people, they'll have two people that have three opinions. But they, um, <laughs> the main, I think the main thing is is that what was interesting to me when Gretchen was speaking was that she was talking. At, first of all, she talked about kind of imaginatively kind of bonding with people that aren't here today. But in some sense, being able to stand in Van Gogh's shoes or be in their workshop and that is in some way directing her work today, and I thought that's really crucial actually to what we connect with as audiences. I mean, Gretchen maybe as her, her own first audience starts out kind of in the shoes of someone else. But then, you know, as audiences to her work, as she's saying, she can't control who looks at it and how these days. Sorry, this is making a bit of a noise. Um, but actually, there seems to me, as a viewer, as an audience, as a non-artist, something that is lost if I can't see that work as Gretchen intended me to see it. And I do feel somehow that some of Van Gogh's works are impoverished by being on a mouse mat. Um, I don't know whether maybe that's the snob in me, but there <laughs> well, seems it's to be... Well, impoverished versus completely lost. Is yeah, that, yeah no, it's good to be reminded definitely of the, and the visuality of it and the colour of it and all these kind of things. So sometimes you see restored paintings and they don't look anything like the painting that you've seen before or you got to know, and you see something new in there. And I think it's really interesting hearing one of the voices that can very easily get lost when you talk about evaluation in philosophy, and this is my bugbear, is that they lose the artist's voice. Yeah, what was the artist agreed. intending to do? Yeah. And increasingly there was a fashion to discuss art yeah. without that intention in there. And I think it's very difficult to make sense of the puzzle if you're missing the central piece. And um, that for me is the central piece. It's your but, earring. But, um, <laughs> Yes. Context, you know, as an artist, especially as a living artist, context is is everything. And I feel that, um, you know, it's it's kind of impossible at this point to place people that with canons or bodies of work that have already passed within the context that they had intended. Yeah. How do you do that? It's like I can today say I want to see my work in this way, and I'm very pedantic mm -hmm. about how I present my work. Um, but yeah. it's I can confirm yes. that. But. <laughs> Um, but I can't, you can't do that with someone that's no longer here. So it, it makes that almost like a very 
um, difficult argument to even discuss. It's like, how do you, you know, I, I have a, an issue with white wall galleries. I have an issue with, yeah. with art fairs. I have an issue with the way that they decontextualize the work in that, in that, you know, in that realm. But when you see a Picasso or you see a Van Gogh or you see all these different paintings or like myself, I study ancient Egyptian um, you know, uh, culture and philosophies, and it's very much imbued in the work I do. And you go to the British Museum, and you go to the Met, and you go to these institutions that have kind of excavated and ransacked all of these things and taken them completely out of context and just dropped them in the middle of a building. And it really doesn't, I don't know if it's, if it's an issue, if it's a problem because we get to engage with it mm -hmm. as, a, as a public, but it's completely out of context of what it was supposed to be intended for. Well, maybe maybe it's romantic, but it's a, maybe some works just carry core cool meanings. It might bring the next question, actually. Mm -hmm. But like in a sense, like almost in a sense, which I think can be understood through the centuries. If you walk through the National Gallery and National Portrait Gallery, they they have different costumes, but I always sense that there's a grasp that you can compare and parallel alongside the centuries because mm -hmm. there's a sense there of what's relevant, and that's actually um, perfect. My next question, thank you, mm -hmm. um, which is you know about originality and what works matters. So we kind of touch on a little bit about judgment, but I think in terms of you two, especially you perfect example for that, um, uh, Gretchen and Lina, because Gretchen has been having a business, uh, not a business mentor, sorry, a painting mentor, <laughs> That's me. Um, <laughs> and you've been, you know, you've been following in the steps of someone artistically to the point that actually your first body of work was, you know, very much the same as Billy. Um, Lena, um, through the pictures of Lena, the, when you come into a studio in New York, it's literally the same color as Yves Klein, so it's the same blue, so I'm sure people must have reference to it a lot. So my, my next question is in terms of, you know, what is the difference when you create that original artistic voice over someone that just executes wonderfully well and integrates ideas? So the difference between referencing and originality. Um, sorry, it's quite full on, but... Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, no, sorry, I wasn't, that was too long, I'm just trying to... Um, you know, I think that it's impossible, you know, we don't live in a vacuum. It's impossible as an artist or to be in any creative field, quite frankly, or just to be a person in the world, to not reference things that have come before you, or reference things that are going on um, contemporarily for you. So for me, you know, uh, I do get that use client association a lot, and mm -hmm. it was definitely a, a choice. But I'm very interested in that conversation about the fact that Yves Klein, this Majorelle blue that Yves Klein, everybody now associates with Yves Klein is because he did a massive body of work, actually his whole career of work, using this blue. So it has become synonymous with him as an artist. However, that blue was predated by Jacques Majorelle, and that's why it's called Majorelle blue. So it's not really, I'm not borrowing from Yves Klein as much as he was borrowing from Jacques Majorelle, as much as he was borrowing from as far back as the ancient Egyptians Ultra using lapis, well. yeah. you know, because it's just this, just this chain of events, and it's going back, so we're always just finding different, or referencing different sources, and it just so happens that there was a, co for me, there was a very instinctual love for that kind of uh, vibrancy of blue that has a certain kind of resonance to me. Do we have it? Yeah. Well, sadly, yeah, it's kind of a bit but light. For but for me, it actually was, it actually references ancient Egyptians more than it references Yves Klein. Like, it really has very little to me with Yves Klein, although I like what he has said about that color blue and what it means, and how it kind of creates this evocative um, reaction, because it definitely does, but he actually is boring from other people too. But so where do you put the line? Because I think it's the same in philosophy. I always got taught you have opinion and you have fault. So you can reproduce an opinion, but then you create your own fault, which is technically artistically the same. Mm -hmm. Well, you have your referencing and then you create your own artistic voice. Mm -hmm. How do you recreate this? Like what, what's, the, what's the line between someone referencing a cupping and someone oh. that just create that original thinking, because yeah. that should be the same in your field as well, I'm guessing. Well, Picasso said, uh, good artists borrow, great artists steal. And, um, you know, I think what he was saying there, I think a lot of people get very lazy, a lot of artists get lazy and think that that means that you can just lift something and almost kind of dump it on in, in the same fashion into their own kind of, and put, put their name on it. For me, um, what he's saying was that, we are voyeurs in life, right? So everything around us is affecting us. We are supposed to be distillers. We're supposed to be people that can filter the world around us. And the uniqueness comes not from the source material that you borrow. You obviously are obviously borrowing source material. It's from the way that that is processed 
once you have had that all that yes, stimuli co go through you, okay. the uniqueness comes and the newness comes, not because of the newness of ideas or concepts or colors or materials or anything, because those things are kind of finite. It's the way that you as an individual filter all that and only you can do it in that way. Sasha, and your feel like... Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think both... So the, if you look at the history of art and the history of philosophy, one of the most immediately striking things is that pretty much everyone we now think of was original and important at the time is derided not only as second rate but also as derivative. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, one needs to think very hard about how that, how that happened. Not mm -hmm. just they thought they were bad, they thought they weren't new. Mm -hmm. Or they thought they were trying, you know, they were just sort of, you know, copying off something that had done, been done before but very, very poorly. Um, I mean, it seems to me that we're not going to, you know, for the reasons that I think we've very eloquently touched on, what, what makes something original can be a very, very complex mix of things. You know, so if, if you're a conceptual artist um, or if you're an artist where there's a heavy role for concepts, it's going to be partly, and this is where I think a kind of dialogue with philosophy helps, a dialogue with all subjects helps, um, partly how you handle those concepts, partly how you frame them. You know, if, if you've got the concept of information, and that's doing a lot of work in the, in the approach, you know, there are clearly lots of different ways of thinking about information. You know, if you're an electrical engineer, I push the switch, the light gets information in the sense that mm -hmm. it gets the current. You know, the medievals had a certain way of thinking about information, the 19th century, a different way of thinking about information. So we've got all these different ways of thinking about it. And it seems to me that you, know, you can be original in, there's no limit to the possible mechanisms through which originality can happen. And if one's a conceptual artist, it's going to be partly through, I think, bringing to the table original takes on the ideas, original takes on, you know, what is information? And I mean, you know, I'm sure this is something you've explored in your work. You know, what is information? How can, has our notion of it changed? How should it change? How must it change? You know, so I don't, think, I don't think there's ever going to be a list of what you have to do to be original, or else it wouldn't be originality. That's good. Do you question or Vanessa wants to add up to that yeah, point? Yeah, so I, I agree with so much um, of what was said about this... Like, I make paintings after Billy, Billy's just copying Van Gogh, Van Gogh was just copying Millet, and everyone's sort of failing in their own way doing that. Um, and that in itself is something. Um, but for me, there's also a huge element of the craft of saying, if I define what I think great paintings are, if I'm copying a painting, if I'm making a version of a painting, you can look at my work and say that's an unequivocal failure. If I'm setting a bar and saying, this is what I want to be, this is what's important, it creates a system of judgment that I accept. Um, and that's really important to me as far as the craft goes. But then also I get to explore philosophically what that means to be doing today. So I make versions of my mentor's work, but then I put them online as not, not Billy Childish paintings because they exist in this liminal space. They are not Billy Childish paintings, but they're also like not, not Billy Childish paintings <laughs> in the same way that an actor playing Hamlet is both Hamlet and not Hamlet and not, not Hamlet. <laughs> so <laughs> what this does is I put this into, um, onto the internet in a way where a human reading the web page has no confusion about what's going on. But search engines just can't handle it. They can't handle that liminality. And so in doing that, I'm going through this um, very dated, very classic artistic process of learning from the work that's come before me. But at the same time, I'm making a statement about image culture today and how something is defined through the internet and algorithms. Um, but I think there's something digitally we can touch on. So in, in, in the art world, trends at the minute are just, it, it keeps on getting faster because also Instagram got in and it's just art fairs that have just multiplied. Um, so, you know, this is something we brushed on very early on but about the role of the philosopher in that sense. But is that something that you see philosophy could be helpful to or is that do you have a particular viewpoint on the fast pace of trends that we're going through and maybe... You're probably not on that same fast pace, I'm guessing. Or? I'd say it probably commercially it's more of interest to me. Just, the, just the, the access and the distribution is so immediate. And I think that does make a difference, the spread of ideas. But just back to your point on the novelty, I thought what's interesting on the newness and the originality mm. is that in itself it doesn't seem to accrue the value unless it's grounded in this kind of integrity position that both artists have here, which is that it... It's fine to be new, but if you're new and that's all you are, you, you can be original nonsense. It doesn't, you know, it's of no use to me, it's of no use to them. But the fact that they're trying to put a new twist or a novelty on their actual experience as people is what's of interest to them, probably to us as audiences. Yep. So Gretchen's experience of not only making the work, but then also presenting the work and finding that she can confound Google 
Google's um, <laughs> algorithms, which I think is genius in itself. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like another Just dimension. Just like yeah, is it, scary enough. It is another dimension <laughs> to the work, because not only do you see the work, but then you get to approach the work from the perspective mm. that Gretchen wants you to approach it, and that, it's like a, du it's like a double layer of cleverness. It's great. But I think that's what, um, that's what I, I, I was saying, like, through going through a national gallery, where you, you see all those people having gone through certain times, and then you yeah. remove the kind of decorum of the times. Yeah. But then you get that feeling that you connect when you read a really good book or you like yeah. look at a really good work of art. And I think it's always a beauty when you have with artists in the same way because yeah. you will just, you will encounter that person having gone through that experience, processing it, adding meaning to it and yeah. somehow you end up in a work, you know, in a work yeah. form and it has a little bit of magic yeah. probably with it. Well, I was just thinking about the point you made earlier, like some, some intentions are lost to us. You know, the artist is gone or there's no record, but a lot of the intentions remain in the work. So as you're walking through the gallery, you might not know very much about that particular artist, but you might be very struck by something that they've made. Mm. And it might occur to you, if you then go and find out more about them, that something about that particular picture doesn't chime with the rest of their style or their genre. Mm. That might teach you something new about the meaning of that work. You might be able to then work out perhaps something in their life story that affected that work in particular. You know, I'm thinking of Ankla and the way that he, a lot of his dramas he was playing out with his relationship with his own father, kind of snuck into the work in a way that maybe even he didn't realise. Of course, we could be wrong yeah. about these things, but it seems that it's there in the work, and I think those are the things that differentiates things like a really interesting and narrative painting from perhaps a really beautifully painted toilet sign, which <laughs> is doing a very different job. You know, it's kind of still directing you to the right place, but perhaps misses out on that, what's essentially going on with the artwork. And in those public spaces, you know, the, the curatorial license that's taken as well is very interesting. It's something we've even discussed prior to, but, um, you know, I just went to the Met Brower, the opening of the Met Brower in New York, and um, they have an exhibition right now called The Unfinished Paintings. And basically, they're paintings of, of artists from, you know, uh, around the... 1400s up until modern day contemporary artists um, and they're all works that are apparently unfinished so the artist apparently did not finish these works and that's also up to debate because sometimes a work is finished when it doesn't look finished you know <laughs> um, but but regardless that whole you know the, the curator of that exhibition has a lot of license to kind of put works together that weren't supposed to be together put artists together in conversation with each other that maybe that they hadn't thought were, you know, that the artist himself didn't feel they were in a conversation with, even if it is their contemporary. Mm -hmm. So it's just a lot of creative license that we all take in these public spaces when, um, you know, when someone else comes in and kind of puts their own mark, their own interpretation on a work. And then it's also, because it's a public space, millions of people are, are viewing it in that way and taking that narrative away, even though maybe that was not intended whatsoever by the artist. But I think that's probably a tag that also philosophy can add up to, which is um, the creator is generally the person trying to capture the times, mm -hmm. so trying to put meanings together and then having that core meaning that somehow you can relate to, very similarly to a movement. Mm -hmm. And I think this is probably where like, it could be a good crossover between the two fields, because you are, at the end of the day, going through a whole lot of ideas to kind of have that a sense um, mm -hmm. so maybe that's, that's I mean that's one other kind of filter it's like you know just like the artist is filtering their environment and putting that onto whatever their medium is um, the curator the museum director the gallery you know curator whatever they're all filtering through their own lens uh, just a bit on a, from, a, from a you know finite group of body of work and saying well this is how I see this is the story I see within it and you know that's that's again it's a license that people take but it's, it's interesting ask a question about that. How do you feel when someone curates or edits your work in a way that you feel isn't true to the work? I've never had that happen. She complains <laughs> and it doesn't um, happen. No. <laughs> um, I'm, like I said, I'm very pedantic about these things. Um, no, I don't, I, I, I'm very hands-on as an artist. I'm not the kind of person that kind of just gives a painting and says, hey, do what you want with it. Mm. Um, I just, because to me, context is actually everything. Mm -hmm. Creating environments for the work to live in is is as important to me as the work because it's a continuation of a narrative. And that's why I say I have a problem with white wall galleries that decontextualize work. Mm -hmm. um, because the work that I create is are about macro issues and I don't think it would do its service to kind of take those those um, that narrative and place it somewhere that's completely devoid of um, a space that is charged with those kind of conversations that you can have within it. Okay. So I kind of don't really have that happen too much. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was just so. It seems to me this is this is a prime example of the kind of area where artists and philosophers can usefully talk. Because 
as you say, so much is going on with the contextualizing of things. You know, you've got the curator, you've got the place, you've got, you know, what notion of space is tied up with the place, and obviously the white cube is going to have a very, very different notion of space to it than the middle of a public thoroughfare to the side of a... Um, some sort of banking institution to the wall of a museum. You've got these radically different notions of space. And I think it's very important to think about these ideas of context and these ideas almost of citationality, of, you know, the creator sort of taking up works and inserting them in his or her own conversation. Um, and that seems to be something that we can do through making works, through intervening in this process, but also by kind of writing about it and talking about it and thinking about it. Um, I had actually a question for you, so it's perfect. Stay on. Sure. Um, is... Um, I think for people not either in philosophy or arts, can you explain a bit about the, the role of philosophy of arts, where you actually cover? Like, I know it's probably very yeah, broad, no, sure, sure, but sure. I think that might be for some, because people will know the history of art more and then the art world of philosophy separately. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, so what people who are interested in philosophy of art are normally interested in two kind of things. So one is, what were the sort of great philosophical systems? What did they think of art? Okay. And some of them have very negative views, so some of them think it's a kind of delusional waste of time that you know, will lead us away from the right path. Some of them think it's a kind of transcendent, you know, the only thing that makes life worth living. And they all have very complicated and interested sto interesting stories about why that is. And often those stories are very idiosyncratic. You know? So some of, them, you know, uh, you know, some of them focused on materiality, you know, the materiality of the work. Some of them focused on the kind of ecstatic response you get to the work. And these are you know, the kind of biography of the individual philosopher writ large through their discussion of art. So that's one thing I think people are interested in. The other thing they're interested in are kind of abstract issues that I'm sure you've all thought about. You know, so can anything be art, right? And obviously one way to address this is by, you know, we've had decades of people making art that addresses this question. But you can also think about it conceptually. You know, if I, if I scrumple up this bit of paper that, you know, is over there and I call it, I don't know, I call it crumpled paper number seven and I, <laughs> I say, you know, this, this, so this bit of paper was a, a research program. It was, you know, an essay or something. Just a few days ago, I was going to send it off to a journal, and now, look, it's just all crumpled up, and this shows so much about the ephemerality of modern knowledge and the transience of, you know... So suppose I do this thing, and then I, I find a gallery stupid enough to buy this from me, right? And I put it in a box, and people come and see it, and, and then someone writes a, an essay about crumpled paper number seven, and they say, you know, unlike Golob's earlier crumpled papers number one through six, this paper is printed on two sides. You know, what was he trying to... You know, is it the two-faced nature of modern academia, perhaps? Um, so you can... And the thing is... It's not impossible to imagine I could do this, right? <laughs> and so then the question becomes, well, if I did that, would I have made a work of art, okay? Or, so, or would I have made a philosophical point, or would I just be a fraud? I mean, you know, to, who, basically, who do you call, right? Do you call the art critic? Do you call the philosopher? Do you call the police? And what, you know, so, so it seems you, this is an example of the kind of thing you might do in philosophy. Right? You're thinking through this issue about, can anyone make art, right? And if, if I can do this, can you do this as well? I mean, have I got the kind of magic Midas touch? Presumably not. We can all do this. So... You know, that kind of thing. And then also some specific issues. I mean, I think something that's, there's been a lot written on recently that's interesting is, say, art and pornography. I mean, can you have pornographic art? Can you have pornography that's artistic? And, you know, in a sense, that reflects the sort of prevalence of pornography in our culture. So you get this mix of kind of timeless issues like the nature of art and then more culturally specific ones. I think that's a good, good introduction. So should we um, open up to questions? Because I'm sure there might be plenty. Um, the first one is always the one that's like shaking and having... Yes, David, please go for it. Yeah. So I, I think everyone across the panel said context was important to a greater or lesser degree, but everyone agreed context was important. And yet, when, when someone who doesn't know anything about art, like myself, and you kind of go around galleries of the world when you're on holiday and there are masterpieces there, and you don't really know anything about the context, but there seems to be broad consensus on what are masterpieces... Uh, out there. Um, what's going on there? Is the context not relevant or is it somehow inferred by, by looking at it or, or is context just not that important when it comes to, to great, great pieces of work? Yeah, um, I'll start um, with that. I think if you're going especially to museums, if you're going to the Prado or you go to the, the National Gallery, you are looking at a lot of traditional mediums. Um, and something that was one of the first things that shocked me in art and really um, spurred me into it more and more and continues to happen today is I am amazed at how many people agree on what a great painting is. And it, it can be as simple as I show you five paintings and you tell me which one you like best. Um, and it, it is a little bit like beer or wine that the more you drink it, the more you are likely to have 
a particular taste or a particular preference that might be considered refined. Um, but one of, it, it still shocks me and I love it when Maureen and Billy and my husband and my dad and an art critic all say, this is the best painting you've made in the last six months. And they do, they, they just agree on it. And that's an aesthetic thing. Um, it doesn't always happen, but um, I guess, yeah, I think it's much more consensus driven, not necessarily in a populist way, but in a way that people who look at a lot of art tend to agree surprise, and it's, it is to a surprising degree, in my experience. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, so one thing, when I talk about content, I don't want to imply, I think there's a kind of fashion for the idea that everything's constructed, and I think that's, that's gone too far. So I mean, I, I don't think there's a problem with saying that all of us are going to, or the many, many people are likely to like certain things without having a deep art historical knowledge of it, you know. But it, I think the other thing to emphasize, of course, is that you're never seeing things without context. They're just changing the context. So when you walk in and the thing is in a white cube style gallery, that's a particular context designed to make you see it in a particular way. And it's a radically different context from when the thing was an altarpiece, which may have been what it was intended to be. Or, you know, switch the cases around. Or when, you know, like this room, this is how the Victorians used to display pictures. You know, hundreds and hundreds of them piled up well above eye height. I they mean, don't let you do this anymore. Yeah, so, and, and again, this is a different context, and it's setting up it's to see things differently. So I think, I think even when you're wandering around the gallery, however, um, I mean, I'm sure you know a great deal about art, but however much you, one wants to think, well, I don't, you know, I don't know anything about art, I'm a neutral observer, I'm not coming with any prejudices. You're coming with prejudices, and you're being fed prejudices through the setup. And I don't think prejudices are necessarily a bad thing, but they're part of the structure of the situation. Guys? Um. Yeah, no, I think it's a really interesting question because it sounds like it's getting at the heart of, well, how do I judge? Do we all have to be in a fixed point to judge this particular object? Um, and I think what's probably going on in a lot of cases is there's actually two different types of judgment going on, if you want to call them judgments. The first says, goes something along the lines of, this is a beer and it's tasty and I like it. And that can be the same <laughs> for a picture. I can really like a pretty picture, but I can feel that this is a really good piece of art and I don't like it. And those two things don't seem incompatible to me. And I think what's going on with, is in the first case, you're saying, this appeals to me. And in the second case, you're saying, this is really good. And I think when you're saying, this is really good, what you're trying to do is rank it against all the other types in its class and say, why this is special, or stand out in some way, and why is that? And I don't think there's any quick answer to what process goes on for you to get to an answer with that. But I think they're slightly different things. So I'd say... What's interesting about context is, in the first case, you're looking at it very much as yourself now. Do I like it? And in the second one, you're trying to slightly stand outside yourself and say, what's this bringing to the party? And I think, depending on which question you're answering, will depend on, on what you then go on and do. I think on the cynical point of view, um, UCL has done a lot of research about what is the work of art we all get attracted to based on like the color we will prefer and somehow blue is actually one of the ones that drives the most and they use algorithm, the big word algorithm and they, they are in artificial intelligence because they're trying to create this robotic painting that we'll all be attracted to and the system so there also must be this data. Um, maybe that's what Gretchen was bringing along in that way, and that, I'm not saying I'm part of it, but I'm just saying that's the research con you know, currently conducted in that university, and the results are astonishing that there are things all humans seem to relate a lot more than others on composition and colours and pigments and things mm. like this. So, um, Baldessari, artist, conceptual artist um, Baldessari, made a work, I believe in the 80s, that basically was a list of things that were, were would be um, considered a good painting, um, the elements or the things that would require a person to appreciate a piece of work. So he said that, you know, pastorals really work. Um, obviously, you know, the color blue is really strong. When you have the color blue, people seem to be more drawn to it. Um, for me, what actually, I'm actually what was interested in what you said was, is something that I really have to tell people all the time is, when you say you don't know anything about art, that's a lie. Um, because I don't know anything about art then, and Gretchen doesn't know anything about art. Like, you know, <laughs> what, is it, what does it mean to know something about art? Do you have to be an art historian? Do you have to have gone to college and studied it, and studied it? or do you have to have gone to, you know, uh, gotten an MFA, you know, to, to, to make you a credible 
um, you know, viewer of a piece of art. Not at all. I think that in actuality, what is most important is the layman's view, the quote-unquote layman's view of a piece of work, because that is far more instinctual and not, is not built up upon a whole series of things that you've been taught are correct or not correct and how to view and, and appreciate something and how to, cr how to critique it. Um, I really like to give agency back to the audience and say, do you like it, do you not like it? And you can have your reasons and they can be very much drawn and driven by context of, in the academic context, but they can just also be very visceral and very, very intuitive. And that's what I prefer. I prefer people that engage with work in an intuitive way. And is Isn't that the opposite to having the artist's context? No, because I don't believe that you have to um, understand the context of the artist. Because I have a context, because I have a story, a narrative, a whole backstory that's very evolved and very deep, and you know, I don't want you to only be able to view it and appreciate it having read the white plaque next to it that gives you a dissertation about what that work is about. I think it should exist devoid of that. If you're interested to know, if you want to know that narrative and you want to seek it further, then by all means do so, and then you can find out the whole story behind it. But I think a work of art should exist by itself, and you should be able to appreciate it or not like it by itself, and that is the, the, the initial um, you know, demarcation. It's the initial, it's the initial thing to understand. It's not really about... The, the story, the story comes second, right, I think. I do think it's a set of belief and values and sensitivities you develop as well. So usually what's so strange on, on my end, like when you I meet artists, we have similar references, but we only know about it six months to a year later. Books like um, 19th century paintings that we bought, like but references that way. So I think it may be... You know, they always say a certain type of book, certain type of art, but maybe it's just simply your sensitivities and your belief and your set of values and meanings and what you consider important in life. You look for it in visual forms on a continuous basis because it does, it does, it is also surprising that your passes and then you just realize actually all those references were there as well. Mm -hmm. So, next question. <coughs> Francesca? <laughs> Because we've solved everything. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, for me, the main differences between art and philosophy, art, you have this visual um, result, I guess. You get this final form, at least in part. You have the artwork in front of you. Um, with that, you can say, you know, your first impression of a piece of art, what is that? And do you need to know something about the artist before, or can it just be out of the blue? Whereas with philosophy, I think it's more of a build-up. Um, it can only get better, cannot get worse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Francesca, that's quite intense. <laughs> Sasha, Vanessa, please. <laughs> so, so sorry, I don't know if I quite... So in philosophy, you, the more familiar you get with it, the better it will... Or the more you can... Exp it can never get um, less of an idea, if that makes sense. If you see an artwork and you have that really great first impact and it yeah. really influences you. Oh, I see. And then, and then sometimes you get dulled to that, that impact. So I think it really depends on how good the philosophy is and how good the <laughs> art is. I mean, that's not one of which an answer that's going to help you there. But um, one, I think one of the big surprises to me was that um, with philosophy, actually, was that it's, it's quite an obstacle to get into. It creates quite a lot of... I agree with that. It's quite an obstacle course. So the first time you do philosophy, you think, oh, it's going to be really amazing. I'm going to learn great things. And then you have to sit down for a year and learn if P and Q and P's and Q's and what's going on and who cares. And then about a year later, you might get to read something that's really interesting. So I'm not... I think one of the problems with philosophy is that it's so forensic and sometimes the problems that it distinguishes that you need to look at seem so fine-grained that actually you can't hear it when you first come to it. Um, and one of the things that I always find refreshing about art is that great art is so impactful and so immediate. But I think that the, I, I think that the more you look at a great painting or a great piece of art, the more you do get out of it. And I think the more you can quieten down your own mind and let in what you can see the more enriched your experience is. And in that sense, it's very equivalent to philosophy or good philosophy. Um, I think the really difficult trick is working out which is the good stuff and which isn't, so you don't waste too much time sitting in front of the wrong pictures. I've got this, great, I have this great test for this um, that I learned from a security guard at the Contemporary Art Museum in San Francisco, <laughs> um, which <laughs> I think if you had to be a security guard um, or just look at the difference between 
the guy whose job it is to guard the Van Goghs at the National, Port, at the National Gallery and the person standing in front of whatever's at the ICA right now. Um, and, <laughs> like, and I, again, like, not all, all art is an endurance game. Not all art is um, to be saturated in that way. I think maybe ideas are the same time, like, maybe the same way. Like, you may think, oh, Nietzsche was kind of an interesting guy, but I don't know if I'm going to live my life that way. Mm -hmm. um, for me, like, that, that is what my art is. It's what I want to spend my entire life in and around, and like I'm the artist, like I get that it should be a little bit more intense for me. Um, <laughs> but I would just much rather be the guy guarding the Van Goghs. <laughs> Maybe with a book in your I'd head. rather be the yeah. person making them. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting, I mean, from the kind of inside that um, the way you set it up, because it seems to me that the dynamics go both ways in both areas, right? So I think there are lots and lots of philosophers where the first time I read them, I was sort of like, wow, you know, this is, there's something really, really significant here that I now actually quite viscerally dislike <laughs> because over time I've come to think, and maybe I'm right about this, maybe I'm wrong about it, that what I thought was there isn't there and that what is there is a kind of mix of evasions and sentimentality and other things that I don't, I don't like. Um, so I think, you know, philosophy can decline just as art can. I think there's going to be lots and lots of artistic cases where you spend more time with it, it changes and transforms, and particularly music, you know. I'm sure we've all come across the idea that if you're going to hear a new piece of music you haven't heard before in concert, you should listen to it first. Okay, so you and try and listen to it somehow on CD or try and listen to it on the... You know, just so that when you go, it's not completely unfamiliar. And there's at least some process of acclimatization going on there. And, you know, the thousandth time you hear whatever your favorite piece of music is, in a sense, it's the same as the first time. In a sense, it's utterly different. But it can also be utterly different and better, I think. And maybe utterly different and worse. It depends on you and the music, but it could be better. I don't know if this is answering your question, but, you know, you look at how we regard Van Goghs and the Picassos and so on and so forth that are, very, are removed now from them, from their context. And then you look at someone like a Jeff Koons or a Damien Hirst or people that are popular artists today um, that have quote unquote been written into the art canon but then only time will really tell um, you know will Jeff Koons outlast the next 300 years of whatever is being produced over the next 300 years will it stand up to it um, you know that is something we can't answer we can't but um, you know how do we how we are viewing and kind of uh, critiquing great art that is contemporary, art that's showing at ICA, art that's currently showing in an exhibition we're doing in Freeze, you know, all these things, will they stand the test of time is kind of a nebulous, we don't know, right? But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it, that's a very engaging and time I also question. find it's a big distinction between um, the artists that were famous during the time, as you say, people that passes through the time. So it's always surprising when you go back to like 19th century or early 20th century to see the trendy artists, you know, were around the aristocracy, were painted a lot of famous painting. Actually, a lot of those, we don't know about them. No, it's mostly people that you didn't like, they didn't like in their, ti in their time, and that mm -hmm. kind of have lasted um, and transcended. So be the weirdo on the side, basically. Yeah, yeah. But let's, so just, I mean, on this, this is, I think, a, a really interesting result, because if you get to this point, you think, you know, look, and it's the same with philosophy, right? You look back at the history of philosophy, you look back at the history of art, the people we now think are good, by a ratio of about nine to one, were thought to be terrible mm -hmm. at the time, mm -hmm. right? And that makes you kind of think if the mechanisms we're using for picking these people out are not very accurate. <laughs> and it also makes you think, you know, if I walk into my, my amazing new exhibition at the ICA, I've got to ask, you know, where am I going to come out in this, right? So mm -hmm. if I'm one of the people who's splendid in the time, then the odds suggest that in 50 years, I'm not going to be at the top. You know? <laughs> Beware of success. I don't know, <laughs> don't know about the there. But. <laughs> Do we have a final question? Do have a, do yes, a question? oh, we do. Perfect. Go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, uh, thanks. Um, this, this isn't really a, a, a question, but perhaps a few sort of uh, related points. Um, philosophy and art, yes, but which philosophy? Um, Matisse famously said in a letter to Plainet, 1946, seven, something like that, I feel the need to keep my distance from all theoretical ideas. Why? Because they have no relation to my practice. I really liked what Matisse said. I think that's great. I, one of the things I'm, I totally agree with is the more I paint, um, the more confidence I have in my paintings, the better they get. It's 
more clear to me how much mystery and how much philosophy has nothing to do with it. It's that it's the sort of stuff that as an intellectual you don't even like to talk about because it makes you feel like I'm from Northern California, which I am. <laughs> like, but it's, it is that. It's the more I get into this, the more I'm sure that thinking and, and even myself isn't a large part of it. Well, I think you found a, an artist that believes who lines on that basis. <laughs> Um, do we want to... Yeah, I mean, I, I mean just one, one thing on that is, that, I mean, it's interesting that, you know, the Matisse worry, right? I mean, one of the, the major, major, major obsessions of the, the last century of philosophy has been to not deliver theoretical analyses. It has been an absolute obsession with a getting back to experience, you know, the fine texture of experience, the fine texture of what it's like to pick up the paintbrush, what it's like to pick up the hammer. So... Process. And, and, you know, some of the people who've gone down that road will end up in, these, in the position of talking of mystery as much as anyone else. So I think it need to be an, it's not an opposition between philosophy and art. This worry about theory as a general cultural worry that you see writ large in philosophy as you do in 20th century literature as you do in lots of 20th century art. And I think the best way to think through it is to bring together these disciplines and try and make sense of what's happened and where we can go. I think I, I will back up with that in terms of a continuum of reactions where we were initially talking about this at the beginning with that specific balance. But, um, but yeah, formation is born out of too much of process art. So I, I hear what you say about Mattis. I think conceptualism has gone after that and process art has gone that. And I think it's a continuous cycle of reactions, which is why probably the answer is to kind of continue the dialogue somehow. Um, because, yeah, process art has been pushing this away for about 10 years now. Um, next questions, yes, please. Sorry, Francesca, could we pass the microphone? Thank you very much. Um, Sasha said something quite interesting. He said that uh, uh, about concept and process, he said that you can come to a, a state or a level perhaps that you can go beyond any differentiation between the two. Um, and I was just wondering whether there are any philosophers or any artists who have actually uh, uh, spoken about this. And uh, it seems to me that you, you kind of go beyond thinking about art or the process of art, but you come to uh, a kind of imme an immediacy of experience uh, that kind of is an expression and, and a shaping of our being itself. So um, is, is there anyone who's uh, spoken about that? And, and, and that, and that uh, is, is no longer perhaps even an art, it's just, it's just life now. And yeah, yeah. I, I think this is someone that we mo both might really love. Um, Ankara, is that how I pronounce his name? Ankara? The, yeah, the... So um, earlier, Sasha was talking about, you know, novels about obsession, philosophy about obsession, and then there's some art that just is obsession. Mm -hmm. And every day when he sat down to paint the date, or every morning when he sends a postcard off that says, today I woke up at 9.15, send. Today I woke up at 6.15, send. Um, not emails, like actual postcards. Um, it's conceptual, it's process, but he is very much living this obsession that is the art. It's, I think, a place where the performative elements of maybe both of what we do really um, connect what it, what it means for us to embody our art, which I might want to express the aesthetic side of that first, and Lena might want to express the conceptual side of that first, but ultimately our philosophies are for our little countries of one. Like, we decide what's important to us, and we embody that. It's, it's really awkward to have a philosophy of art that is anti-philosophical, but that's what I'm up here talking about. <laughs> like, but it's just my ideas and how I live and how I practice. Um, and it's... Yeah, that's, that's very true, the Gretchen said. You know, there's a, to me, there's a very um, tenuous division between when art begins and when life, and life uh, ends, or vice versa. Um, so... Basically, to me, it's uh, what I what I really would like to do as an artist that's living as an artist is to live my art and embody it in every capacity. And um, I haven't done it yet. I failed. I fail all the time at it. Um, but basically, what that means is that to me, there's no division. It's very symbiotic. The things that I think about, which, mind you, are not you know when we say theory and the concepts that kind of go into the work, is not a conscious thing. It's like these things are swilling around all the time, and you're just going through these emotions and these processes and it's not and it's to me it's like getting to the essential the essential nature of of like what is 
I filtered over these over my last 29 years, you know. But um, basically, um, yeah, it's to me, it's about kind of which a lot of artists aren't about. A lot of artists like they put their work on their canvas, they put their their work and ideologies and their philosophies into their sculptures, they put it into whatever the medium is, but there is a very performative aspect to kind of how I choose to, um, you know, live the life I do and how that bleeds into the work and how the work bleeds into my life. And, there, and I wish at its best, it'll be symbiotic completely. And it will, like, you know, I think someone that did it really well was James Lee Byers. James Lee Byers had no distinction between life and art. Like, he was his art. He was a walking manifestation of his ideas, his macrocosmic crazy ideas about, you know, the artist and his place in the world, and the artist, and um, I wish I had some kind of references people to, to see that didn't know James Lee Byers, but um, he, you know, he just had no distinction. And I think that's an artist that actually can blur those lines really beautifully. Yoyoi Kusama, someone that probably most people know here, she does it very beautifully too. You know, I can't speak for her personal life and how she lives her day-to-day -day life, but her performative, you know, <coughs> on, in front of the public gaze life is very one, at one with her, with her work. You know, and those ideas lead into each other. And she just definitely embodies that kind of her, her aesthetic and her concept. Or even just the, the Fluxus movement. Um, we talked a little bit about movements before, and, and the Fluxus goal was to uh, end art by making life and art indistinguishable. Yeah. I'd um, just like to second the vote for Byers. I mean, I think there's, we all need to spend more time thinking about Byers and trying to understand what Byers was doing. I mean, it seems to be incredibly important. Yes. I think that's kind of the thing that most um, that's really interesting for me in the philosophy is I, th I think it does follow the art. I think the art's doing the noticing a lot of the time. And it's, it's visualising it for us um, and what the philosophy does sometimes is it just helps, it just helps spread it slightly, maybe further afield. Like you get these kind of discussions going and it invites more people in. But I think a lot of the time the art's doing something so unique and, and that, that's the thing that I like to see coming back into the philosophy with that kind really of noticing. <laughs> Well, I think that's definitely the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, thank you all for being here this evening, and I hope it will get your you know, brain going. So, uh, there's probably a lot more to talk about in those five, six hours and essays to read, but that's like a nice little introduction, I think, to the question. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>